Uh, our next speaker will address us about the communicative and cultural dimensions of taxation with a particular focus on implications of digital digitalization for the future of tax systems. Let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Rebecca Brummel. Rebecca is a reader in cultural, uh, cultural politics at the University of the Arts London and project leader of Redistributive Imaginaries, a European project funded by Chance. And Rebecca's research focuses on the communicative dimensions of taxation, exploring the cultural frameworks that enable people to make sense of tax, public spending and their tax-paying identities. Rebecca, uh, stage yours. Welcome. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to Laurie and everybody in the foundation for organising this and inviting me. It's a real privilege to be able to present my research to you. Um, as you heard in the introduction, I am a researcher at University of the Arts London. Um, I'm also the project leader of Redistributive Imaginaries, which is a three-year research project um, involving five countries, including Finland. And in this project, we're looking at the digitalization of redistribution practices in Europe. Um, and I'm also really proud to be an advisor to Tax Justice UK, which is an organization set up in 2017 in the UK. Um, it campaigns for pro progressive taxation, and it's a sister organization of um, the Tax Justice Network, which many of you will know very well. My talk has got two parts. In the first part, I'm going to introduce my general approach to researching taxation, which is rooted in the humanities and social sciences, so a bit different from the first two talks that we've had today. Um, and I've been developing a different kind of research agenda for um, the study of taxation. And this agenda places social meaning at the centre. So I'm going to talk about why it's so vitally important for us to pay attention to the cultural and communicative dimensions of taxation and how policymakers can do that. And in the second part, I'm going to talk about um, our project, Redistributive Imaginaries, and I'm going to share some early provisional findings from that research, focusing on the relationship between digital fundraising and taxation. And the main point that I want to get across today is that the social meaning of taxation is being shaped by new social developments like digital fundraising and crowdfunding. We might think that these new developments have nothing to do with tax, but if we want to anticipate the future of tax systems and welfare states in Europe, it's imperative that we understand the changes that are taking place in our social worlds and economies that are producing new social meanings about redistribution. So the first part of the talk, I'm going to talk about social meaning and communication in a global culture. Tax is, of course, we, as we've been hearing, much more than just a, t a technical instrument. It has really rich cultural and social meanings. And to some degree, everyone in society participates in the production of those meanings. Depending on the national cultural context that we're located in, the meaning of tax differs, and meanings also change over time. And uses of this term can be divergent. We don't always agree all the time about what tax is. If you're an accountant or an economist, maybe this question might seem pretty straightforward. Taxes are the charges that are levied by governments on workers and businesses, and they're defined as such in law. But in fact, there are lots of examples um, where the definition of tax is not so clear cut. So for example, in the UK in 1989, Margaret Thatcher's government introduced a flat rate levy that they wanted to call the community charge. They were really concerned about the brand image of this new, new levy. And they wanted to avoid calling it a poll tax because of the negative historical connotations of that term. But there was huge resistance to the community charge because it was seen as being unfair and imposed without popular consent. So it's an example of 
popular mobilisation, in this case of the pejorative associations of tax, an unfair levy imposed without popular consent. And it's also an example of how the production of social meaning about taxation is something that we're all involved in, um, even if some people and some institutions have a lot more power and influence in asserting dominant meanings. So communication then is absolutely central to how tax works in our societies. What we say to each other about tax shapes our understanding of what it is, and what it can do, and whether we should like it or not. So here's an email that I received recently from the Labour Party um, just last month, which has something to say about tax. And we're gearing up for an election, of course, um, which we expect to happen later this year. And Labour want me to know that I'm worse off than I was 14 years ago. And they want me to know that the Tories, the Conservative Party, have made a mess of the um, economy. And the email tells me that since December 29 alone, um, 2019 alone, there have been 25 Tory tax rises. And the tax burden is now set to the highest on record. Tax burden. Well, it's true that taxation is now at its highest level on record in the UK, 37% of GDP. But the question is, how do we choose to communicate about that? And this is really contested, controversial language that the Labour Party have chosen to use. And rightly, I think, campaigning groups like Tax Justice UK have suggested that progressives shouldn't be using the term tax burden. It has such negative connotations, suggests that tax is an affliction, something we need to get rid of. And it's an example of libertarian language about tax getting into the mainstream of political discourse. We also need to think about tax as a cultural object, um, a topic that's represented in popular culture. And this, of course, is AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the US Democratic politician at the Met Gala in 2021, wearing her tax the rich dress. And I think what's probably most interesting about this intervention, about um, a lot of the interventions that she makes into the popular culture of tax, is that these images are mainly um, intended for an audience in the US. Um, that's where AOC wants to focus her efforts. But because of our globalized media culture, and in particular because of the global spread of um, social media platforms like Instagram and Twitter, these interventions are also immediately shared with audiences around the world. So even though we still have very distinct national tax regimes and different national tax cultures, the language and the demands of the tax justice movement are increasingly shaped by this globalised media culture. OK, so when I talk about tax in this way to people with a professional interest in taxation, like you, um, they tend to agree that this cultural perspective is very important particularly over the last 15 years or so since the global financial crisis, it's become very hard to ignore that public engagement with the idea of tax is changing. But the more difficult question is, what do we do with that knowledge? How do we bring the social meaning of taxation into discussions about policymaking, into campaigning, into advocacy for progressive taxation? Well, I think the first thing we need to do is recognise there's often um, quite a gulf between how people who know a lot about taxation, tax experts, think about tax, and how non-expert citizens understand tax and redistribution. So, for example, the way that tax experts understand corporation tax and corporation tax avoidance is very different from how non-expert citizens understand it. And when we're thinking about those differences in understanding, it's very easy to fall into the trap of thinking that the public have just got confused. 
they've got it wrong. But if we think about the public in this way, if we assume that they've just got confused, this suggests that the solution is to ensure that they're better informed. So it becomes a problem of information and misinformation. And actually, this is the idea that drives a lot of interventions into public understanding of tax. So this is a screen grab from the Institute of Fiscal Studies um, website, which is called Tax Lab, which sets out to explain taxes to ordinary people. There's lots of data on here, lots of explainers, um, lots of really helpful demystifying of economic language. This is all very useful, but if we get stuck on this solution, thinking that we just need to provide better information, we're not going to win the fight for progressive taxation. Social meaning about tax is precisely that. It's socially produced, and it's connected to deeply embedded ideological frameworks. So providing someone with accurate information about how income tax works or how private pensions are taxed, it isn't going to have very much impact on their general perception of what tax is, what it can do, and whether or not they feel positively about it. So what alternative approach am I suggesting? How can we bring the social meaning of taxation into discussions about policy making? I don't have any simple answers, but I've put together some suggestions which I think point us in the right direction. And the first suggestion is, of course, to pay attention to the social meaning of taxation and to recognise where there are discrepancies between expert and non-expert understandings of taxation. And as I've been saying, we should avoid treating this gulf in terms of a problem of poor information. And instead, we should consider why popular perceptions may be different. We can explore how those perceptions are connected to broader frameworks of meaning, broader ideological positions, and work out how that gulf can be bridged. It's also important to remember that not all economic communication is mediated. It's very easy to get fixated on what's happening in the media and particularly what's happening in the news media. But we learn about economic issues in our everyday lives as much, through them, as much as through the media. And that's particularly true for people who don't have any interest in economic news or the macroeconomy. And I think finally, if you're somebody who commissions research on public opinion, a really practical step that you can take is to broaden the research methodologies that you're using. Um, polls and surveys give a very narrow, narrow, very limited view of popular understanding of taxation. They tell us absolutely nothing about why people think the things that they do. So a good solution here is to commission more qualitative research um, using uh, you know, a very wide range of possible methodologies, focus groups, qualitative interviews, um, or more creative methods. How do people understand tax? Um, how do they make sense of it? We can find out by, by asking them. So this is on the left here is an example of a piece of research conducted by Tax Justice UK back in 2020 which used focus groups to understand what people think about um, public spending, wealth and taxation in the UK. And another piece of research that I did with my colleague Liam Stanley, which used some creative methods to explore communication challenges around taxation. Okay, so that was my um, introduction to my general approach to researching taxation and now I'm going to talk about how we're using that approach in um, our project redistributive imaginaries <clears throat> and I'm just going to get a, a little bit of water if that's okay so we were awarded funding for this project 
um, from the Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Programme, along with 25 other projects. And um, all of these projects are investigating transformations in European societies related to digitalisation. And the project consortium is made up of five universities, and we have at least two researchers in um, each university contributing to the project. And we also have five cooperation partners um, um, who work with us to give us advice about the project, and the foundation is one of those cooperation partners. And we're all studying our own countries, our own national context, apart from the team in Germany are studying Montenegro. So why a project investigating redistribution? I'm, I'm not sure this really needs addressing, really, given what we've talked about this morning, but um, we think that this current conjuncture is an absolutely critical moment for public understanding of collectively funded social systems. Um, the global financial crisis, austerity, COVID-19 pandemic. As we know, these crises all contributed to demands from civil society for greater redistribution. But political leaders are not responding adequately to these demands. In fact, most want to actively distance themselves from the language of redistribution. So thinking about the UK as an example, we can see that this is a moment of high risk for the social meaning of taxation. I mentioned earlier that tax is now at its highest level on record. But as Will Davis has pointed out very recently, working people who pay income tax um, in the UK are mainly experiencing this through fiscal drag. So marginal, <coughs> excuse me, marginal tax rates have been frozen since 2021. So large numbers of taxpayers are getting pulled into higher tax bans. And because the tax rises are happening in this way, they've never been politically argued for or justified. So we have no one, including the Labour Party, making a positive case for higher taxation. In fact, Keir Starmer has said that he prefers to grow the economy and that focusing on redistribution fundamentally disrespects working people. And that Labour Party position is completely at odds with um, the recommendations we're getting from economists who are attuned to climate breakdown, who are telling us that we must stop relying on economic growth to solve our problems, and we must start having the argument about redistribution. So in each of the countries we're studying, there is a different sense of how um, how marginalised or how central this discussion about redistribution has become. And in each country, we think that this national conversation matters a great deal for the future of welfare states in Europe. What will become of welfare states if steps are not taken to tax the rich more heavily? What will happen if confidence in the idea of tax is eroded? And these are huge challenges, but through our project, we want to make a contribution to addressing them. So we are researching redistribution, but one of the things that's really distinctive about our project is the way that we are approaching and defining redistribution. We're approaching taxation as just one mechanism in a broader ecology of redistribution. So we think there's a relationship between taxation and other kinds of non-market transactions that people engage in to support and help other people. So we're thinking about taxation and public spending alongside charitable giving, philanthropy, mutual aid, all different forms of what we can call pro-social contribution. So why this expanded definition? Why do we think it's important to consider the relationship between these different social mechanisms? Well, it comes back to social meaning. We think that social meaning about taxation is shaped by people's engagement with these other mechanisms of redistribution. For example, an innovation in the charity sector may have implications for how we understand tax and public spending. 
The development which prompted this research is the rapid digitalization of redistributive mechanisms. If we want to give money to a cause or contribute to a fundraising effort, we're very likely to be using a website or an app or an innovative payments technology or a crowdfunding platform or even social media. And we're interested in how these digital innovations and people's experiences of using them may be changing the way they think and feel about paying tax. And that's what we mean by redistributive imaginaries. I'm going to give you a concrete example now. So these are some images of payment interfaces installed by an organisation called TAP London. And they're in many locations in central London, places like train stations and coffee shops. And they have a partnership arrangement with the Mayor of London seen on the right. Um, so he's, he leads the Greater London Authority. So essentially this is a partnership with local government. And these payment interfaces invite people, Londoners, to tap the, the payment interface and help homeless people. So in terms of our interest in digitalization, this is really just a very simple contactless payment system. Um, the innovation is in bringing um, these interfaces into public spaces in the proximity of homeless people. So you will see homeless people near these um, interfaces. And taking donations for a very specific amount and purpose. TAP London say that they're using digital technology to solve a problem that arises in our increasingly cashless societies. How do you give a homeless person your spare change when you're not carrying spare change anymore? And there's an accompanying discourse from this organisation about the generosity of Londoners and their, their um, desire to donate to social causes, um, particularly if it's made easy and straightforward for them to do so. So I think you can appreciate our interest here because from one perspective, this three pounds looks a bit like a kind of voluntary hypothecated tax um, that um, is being presented to deal with a social issue that, that people in London really, really care about. So they want to do something about this problem. And what interests us here is a certain ambivalence or lack of clarity about what state actors, so local and national government, and other actors, charitable sector, civil society, businesses, what those actors should be doing to address this, um, to address welfare needs. And also a certain ambivalence about how we should pay for these interventions through taxation and public spending, or through voluntary transfer and donation. And TAP London actually talk really explicitly about these two options. Around the time that this organisation launched this scheme, one of the founders of the organisation made a statement about the role of charities in addressing social issues. And she was very keen to emphasise that digital fundraising is not the solution to homelessness in London. And she said that charities, technological innovation and fundraising ensure that there are buffers and support, but these are lifeboats. For resolution, we need to stop people falling in the water in the first place. And then she goes on to say that um, the difference between these kind of buffers or lifeboats and systemic change. And systemic change would look like re-evaluating policies, tax spend, and the way that, the, that governments treat the most vulnerable in society. So in the UK, we have a really mixed economy of welfare. For the last few decades, at least, it's become completely normalised that charities and civil society organisations are heavily involved in delivering welfare services. But we can see from this statement, there's still a great deal of sensitivity um, around digital innovation that seems to be stepping too far into social provision. 
Um, there are norms here that are being tested and challenged, I think. But that is very, very different from how the more commercial actors in this sector talk about what they do. We're looking at um, a diversity of different digital interfaces, um, tools, platforms that people use to donate um, um, and transfer money to help other people. And one piece of work we've done recently is for every research team to um, study how the crowdfunding site GoFundMe is used in their national setting. Now, I'm sure you know that GoFundMe is used very extensively in the US to crowdfund for medical fees. And it's also used across all of the countries that we're studying. But the volume of crowdfunding is very, very different, very variable, and it's being used for different purposes. For example, in Finland, there's a very low volume of crowdfunding because of the strict regulation or fundraising. And we nonetheless still find people using the platform in Finland and um, including using it to try and meet welfare needs, medical needs. When we look at the way that GoFundMe frames its role and purpose, we found a, a much more general story. It's very different from the story that TAP London are, are telling. What we find on the GoFundMe platform is this universalizing discourse about everyone wanting to help each other, everyone wanting to make things better, but people sometimes need a bit of extra help. And help, by which they mean money, is articulated as um, a universal value which brings communities together. The existence of welfare states, taxes, public finances, and collective provisioning of people's welfare needs, that is a topic that's almost completely ignored um, except to implicitly suggest that these social systems are deficient in some way. So these are the kind of digital interventions that we're interested in. And the analysis that we're working on considers digitalization in the particular welfare state, um, welfare state context in each country. And we're aiming to produce some comparative findings um, in this project, which is a huge challenge, as you can imagine, because there are some really critical differences between these countries. The welfare state typologies give us a starting point for thinking about the different norms and expectations around welfare provision in each country, as does the tax to GDP ratio. So these are the OECD figures for 2022. And the status of each country in relation to the EU is also interesting because we can identify EU values um, in relation to the digital um, as expressed through certain kind of European Commission projects and so on. And this is particularly important to understanding um, digital developments in Montenegro, uh, which is the semi-peripheral candidate country that we're, that we're studying. But there are some more variables that we want to bring into our analysis, particularly around, around the size of the fintech and alternative finance sector in each country. Um, and this is where the majority of the digital innovation is coming from. And again, there are huge differences between these countries, with the UK notably set apart in terms of the, the size of the alternative finance market. Another variable is regulation. Uh, until I started working on this project, I really didn't know about how heavily um, fundraising is regulated in Finland, which has significantly constrained this donations-based crowdfunding market here. So as we're developing this comparative analysis, we'll be looking at how these digital interventions are shaping um, citizens' expectations about the welfare state and about how welfare provision should be funded through taxes or through donations. And I'm gonna just finish with an example from Finland. 
I think perhaps some of you might be thinking that because of the regulatory environment here and historically strong welfare state, um, at, you know, maybe the developments that I've been talking about are less relevant for this country. And I think that's true to a certain extent. But what we've already found is that there are considerable commonalities across each country, both at the level of discourse and public debate, and in terms of digitalization projects. So this is a quote from uh, an interview with one of the founders of Mesinati.me from around the time when it was launched. And she says that our social system already funds culture, social projects, and also innovations. So it's already a kind of crowdfunding system where people put money together to fund important things. So despite the high level of regulation here, um, despite the social democratic type welfare state, the high tax to GDP ratio, you have this kind of advocacy of crowdfunding being articulated in public discourse. And you have US digital platforms like GoFundMe actively looking to um, expand their markets around the globe. So I think that these developments are highly relevant for every national setting. We all need to be thinking about how the digitalization of donations is going to shape public attitudes to paying tax in the future. And we all need to be thinking about what our welfare states will look like if these commercial developments continue unchecked. So if you're interested in our project and you want to be the first to know about um, our findings as we publish them, please do follow us and you can sign up for our mailing list um, on our website. Um, I'd also be really happy to hear from anybody about anything I've talked about today. Very happy to carry on with the conversation. So thank you. Thanks. Thanks to Rebecca. Uh, yeah, we have some time for some questions before the lunch break. Uh, you mentioned uh, in the presentation that uh, even the Labour Party prefers economic growth instead of uh, redistribution. Yeah. It seems like there isn't so many fans of redistributions in the society uh, anymore, and the whole uh, idea of redistribution is uh, kind of losing, it, uh, losing its momentum. Uh, do you have any idea what has caused this uh, phenomenon? <laughs> well, I think we would all have a sense of what those causes are. Um, sometimes we like to talk about them in terms of neoliberalism, right? Um, that's a, a, a term which we can use to talk about a lot of the economic and social changes that have happened um, around the world over the last you know, 30 years or so. Um, and they are about um, changing the tax base, they're about eroding certain kind of um, commitments and relationships that people have to um, collectively organised projects like welfare states, right? Um, and so I think they're many and varied, um, but I certainly think that we're at a kind of um, crunch point and that um, the fact that the Labour Party are not do not feel that they are in a position, I think it's a difference between what they maybe would like to do and mm. what they feel they're able to articulate in public debate. They're not able to articulate a commitment to redistribution is really certainly significant, yeah. yeah. Any questions from the audience? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so about, and first of all, thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm thinking about the distribution and growth, so here we're seeing them as two conflicting strategies, mm. whereas if we, if we see, for example, the developments in Finland over the last 30 years, our economy has been growing, it's been struggling to grow during the last 10 years, but still we can see that 
the well distribution has concentrated. And also here during the last years post COVID, the wealthiest 1%, I believe, has also doubled their wealth. So eventually we're only seeing the wealth gap increasing. That doesn't necessarily mean that the economy wouldn't grow, even though the wealth would be distributed more fairly. So eventually we're talking about distribution of power as well. The economy could still grow, it could remain, the wealth gap could remain stable. So if we think about the extreme in Soviet states where the flat eventually didn't work out and take something more, more limited, say, keeping the wealth gap stable at five times between the lowest wealth group and the highest wealth group. So the economy could theoretically still grow. And while it's growing, there would still be for the wealthiest 10%, five times more power either to buy luxury goods or have five times more power to pay for the politics through supporting the campaign, for example. So what is your personal theoretical view on whether it would be possible or not to limit the wealth gap and still have economic growth in place? Well, I think that the, the, the tension or opposition between redistribution and growth that you're referring to in my talk, it's specifically um, really one that's been raised by um, radical economists like James Meadway, who's very concerned about um, economic discourse as normal, as he would put it, um, so the idea that we could just continue on the course that we, we're going on, which is oriented around economic growth, a, as articulated by Keir Starmer, for example, that's the that's the that's the path that we're on. But he's making that he's making that criticism from the point of view of taking climate breakdown into consideration. So he's he's raising serious questions about whether we can continue on that path. Um, and address address climate breakdown. So that's why he's re asking that the argument about redistribution is restarted again. He says that that is absolutely essential um, in order to um, in order to meet meet the needs of meet, meeting um, climate breakdown. So that is a position. Okay, I, I'm very sympathetic to it actually, and I think that he's. Um, He's starting a really important conversation um, at, with many other economists who think there is a problem with measuring the success of an economy by focusing on GDP, right? Um, but that's a position, I think, which um, others will, will question and debate. Yeah. Yeah, on the back row. Thank you for a great presentation. Uh, there was a little bit of criticism on your presentation concerning the Labour Party and, and Starmer, yeah. how they see the tax policy or how they talk about mm. it. So how interested the political parties, from your point of view, are on this how to talk about taxation? And how do you link these mm. uh, ideas or findings to the Labour Party and also the Conservative Party, because the taxation policy, for example, under, under Liz Truss was not so successful, and we see that they have mm. already uh, made some missteps on, on their arguments and how they uh, practice the taxation policy in, in general. So how do you see this uh, political environment in the UK and in general? This is a great question. So the question is about the extent to which political parties and particularly, we're going to be talking about special advisors, these kinds of key figures, how, how interested they are in engaging with the social meaning of taxation. And I would say it's improving, but still very little. Um, there's still this tendency to be led by um, news media discourse about tax. 
So to be, I think, to be convinced by uh, opinion polls uh, around what uh, what the the national view is of a particular tax position, um, and from the Tax Just Justice UK position, you know, there's uh, first of all a lot more complexity to understanding. Um, uh, the population's tolerance of tax changes, their understanding of the implications of certain tax changes. Um, and secondly, um, there's, there's a lot more movement to be had. I mean, my frustration at the moment of closing down a conversation of redistribution is that even if, I mean, some people in the UK currently, a lot of my friends believe that once the Labour Party get in, we're going to suddenly have much more um, progressive uh, policies on tax and many other things. Um, of course, I hope that's the case, right? But I doubt that it's possible when you close down the kind of, you know, the Overton window of what you can speak about and what you can politically advocate for, right? You have to do a lot of um, preparatory work in um, opening up uh, popular debate and in m making, uh, legitimising the decisions that you want to make further down the road. So rather like what Paul was talking about, about wealth, wealth taxes, you have to be having a conversation for a very long time um, in order to do the things that you want to do, right? So I think it's very frustrating at the moment. I think kind of notionally, there's a kind of openness to these these ideas and and particularly the tax, tax Justice UK have been doing really brilliant work about being, you know, there, being advocates for um, progressive tax positions, but we're a long way from, um, uh, yeah, the, the majority of what I'm talking about being on the agenda, I think, yeah. Hey, and then the final question. Go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to thank you also for a very, very interesting uh, presentation. You. Um, actually, I was I was thinking, what what are your views uh, on 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 the topic? I mean, uh, the, the fairness of taxation is is only half of the question, at least in Finland. Mm. The other side is is how how people perceive how eff effectively or 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 um, maybe effectively those tax monies then are deployed by the the yeah. government, because I, I, what I see from the social democratic side has been a very successful cultural campaign, mm -hmm. decades-long campaign, to question public uh, actorship okay. yeah. uh, through public choice theory and so forth, mm -hmm. to undermine the notion that, that even, if the people, even if people support the general aims that, that, uh, that uh, uh, government action in, in welfare or otherwise is, are, are targeted at, they, they question the efficiency yeah. and the, 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 the possibility of carrying out these policies effectively. Uh, uh, I mean, the public sphere is full of, of stories about government inefficiency, even yeah. though several uh, similar kinds of stories could easily be told about the private sector uh, actors, mm. actors as well. And there's, there's a curious thing, because quite often people love something specific that the government does. Uh, for example, the NHS seems to mm. be pretty popular in, in Britain, but still there's this notion of, of general government inefficiency as, as a cultural story that is, is very okay. powerful. Uh, r another really great question. And I think it <clears throat> takes me back to really my interest in crowdfunding and in uh, digital fundraising of all kinds. Because of course, the promise of, of, of giving your money to um, a charity via a digital platform is this efficiency and this speed and this um, the way that you can hypothecate, if you like, your your uh, contribution directly to the cause that you want to choose, and I think these kind of logics of hypothecation, um, which we can understand not just in that kind of narrowly defined way in which it's referred to tax, but these kind of logics of um, individual choice, if you like, in a kind of market of contribution are very, very potentially damaging, right? Um, and they are absolutely um, being exacerbated through the broader um, company discourses of these kind of digital platforms, um, which are, um, you know, 
really compounding a, a hegemonic position now in the UK that, that, that governments are wasteful and that collectively provision systems are wasteful. And this is, <coughs> this is a, an argument that's been strongly advocated by um, um, far right and right wing um, policy institutes in, in the UK, including the Taxpayers Alliance. So this is a very um, distinct kind of political position and discourse. And um, I think there's a, there's a huge battle to find the right language and the right social meanings of tax, taxation, contribution, um, collective provisioning to combat it really, really vocally, actually. Hey, uh, thanks, Rebecca. Uh, the first session of the tax conference is coming to close. Uh, many thanks to our excellent guests, uh, Sarah, Paul, Rebecca. Uh, your presentations and uh, questions and answers have been uh, uh, great brain food, so to say. <laughs> uh, and thanks also everyone who has been following us on the stream. We will continue the broadcast in about an hour. Thank you, everyone.